Good morning, Riverside Church. Pastor Dale here. I have lost track of how many weeks we are into this COVID crisis, this pandemic. We probably should have been tallying and like having a little marker or something. Uh, I've lost track. I have no idea. But what I do know is we certainly miss you guys. Certainly miss gathering together, collecting together. Uh, it's, it's good to talk to you on the phone. It's good to text with you, but I just miss you. And so just know that. Know that we can't wait to gather again. We're going to begin this week. We're going to shift our attention back to Romans, where we were before the Easter season. So we could say it this way. We're going to go from resurrection to Romans. Resurrection to Romans. As I was thinking about that, it fits perfectly because that's Paul's whole thing. His whole thing is about the resurrected life. And, and first with Jesus, right? I mean, this is Paul's story. He, in fact, hinges his credibility. He hinges his personal authority on this statement. I have seen the Lord, the resurrected King, and, and because of that, I'm going to share this testimony with you. His whole thing is based on that Damascus Road experience, that calling from the resurrected Jesus. And so that resurrection story for Paul, his resurrected moment, translates into our resurrected moment. And so we've been building through Romans, if you remember, salvation and, and calling and the goodness of God and conquerors as Christ followers. And now we're going to shift into what some call the Christian paranesius or the Christian ethic, the resurrected life as believers. What does that look like? But first, let me begin with a story from my own personal week this week. Like you all, I got a stimulus check and we were excited but we were holding that enthusiasm in light of the story that I want to share to you, one of those disappointing things about life. Uh, a few weeks ago, we began to see a bubbling in our front yard, some, some water. And uh, for a little while, we've been smelling some, some bad gases, some bad smells. And, and we were fighting drain flies a year ago. And, and so now this water in our front yard begins to bubble. And so me being the, the husband and the dad of the house, the fix-it guy in the house, I go out there and dig a little hole to try to figure it out, and, and I can't really figure it out, but I'm pretty sure we've got septic tank issues. Now, my wife, being awesome that she is, got on the phone and took that off my to-do list, and she lined a guy up, and they had a conversation that went something like, well, soon I'll, I'll get out to your house, I'll, I'll give you a heads up a couple of days out so you'll know. And so she's excited, like, hey, I did this for, for Dale, and, and it took, it's off his plate, and she lets me know, and I'm pumped. And then he decides to call without any warning. I'm on my way. I'm 15 minutes out. Well, she was off guard and wasn't prepared to have someone to the house, and there were some other challenges about timing. And so she said, well, you, you can't come today. It's, it's not a good day for us. And I, I didn't know you were even coming today. And, of course, uh, because there was miscommunication, I guess, on his behalf, or at least his misunderstanding, there was a confrontation, so I get a phone call a few minutes later, and Andrea is crying. She's real upset, and just one of those uh, camel straw moments, you know, and so she calls, I can't believe this happened, and I'm so upset, and she so said, you know what, I'll, I'll call him, and I'll, I'll work it out. Don't worry about it. I'll take it from here, and so I called the guy and said, hey, I think you upset my wife's feelings, and I want to talk to you about it, and I want to try to sort this out, and as I said five or six, seven words, the next thing you know, I get an onslaught of words from him. And now, at first, he's not real angry. He's not yelling. He's not screaming. He's just defending his actions and defending who he is. And it's a little bit like, well, sir, you know, I don't know. I'm just a good old Southern boy, and I just talk plainly. And, and maybe I upset her because I was just talking too frank. I said, well, no, Andrea is from the North. She doesn't really mind frank talk. It's, it's not that. Well, I don't know what I could have de you know, said or done. And so he starts carrying on. And like I said, for every one word I had, he had a thousand just, just talking and talking and talking. And I realized there just wasn't going to be a lot of, I don't know, correction here or a lot of cohesion here between the two of us. And, and so he said some remark that made me realize that he didn't really want to change. I think he said something to effect, well, maybe this is why my wife divorced me. I just, I just am who I am and you just can't change me. I said, well, I just don't think it works that way. I think that we're all trying to evolve and be better people, right? Question mark. And he didn't like that too much. He said, well, you know, you can't change me and I can't change you. And, and he said something to the effect of, you try, I tell you what, you try not to change me and I'll try not to change you. Let's just not do business together. I said, well, that, that's fine. That's fine. We cannot do business together. But, you know, that, 
that was set heavy on my heart. I, one, I don't like confrontation. It never goes super well for me. I, I get worked up inside. and I was, I was proud of myself for handling myself right and properly and effectively. But, but you know, you, you want to defend your wife. You really want to go for it. You, know, you really want to show a presence. And, and we just got nowhere. And it bothered me. It bothered me because he, he kind of bought a lie that, well, there's no changing me and no shaping me. But is that true? Is that really true? Do we evolve? Do we shape? Do we change? Do we transform? Is it even possible? Those are, those are big questions. And that's some of what's happening here in Romans 12. So Paul's personal experience is he's seen the resurrected lamb and he is forever changed by it. I, I think you're like me or maybe, maybe you want to be like us and you, you recognize I want that kind of life-changing, transforming experience. We can all think of different moments that have shaped us. But I, I want to have that life-defining moment with God that I am forever changed. So that's, that's a, our sermon today, is to think about what is evolving as a faith look, look like? What is changing and transforming, shifting? How does that come about and what does it look like? So let's pray. God, as we dive into Romans chapter 12, we, want, we don't want to have that hard, callous heart that says, you know, I'm just me and I can't change. We want to have a kind of a heart and a kind of a life and a posture that says, I want to be better. I want to be a better person. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better worker, a, a better pastor. Uh, I want to be a better spouse. So Lord, help us to be transformed by that resurrection moment that we can all just be better people. And then we pray. Amen. I have a uh, dining room a picture of my dining room, a, a picture of our family that I want to tell you about. But first, let me start with this passage. This is Romans chapter 12. Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourself as, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this picture of my dining room is a picture of uh, my wife and I and our two oldest daughters, Soraya and Jade. And it sits above our dining room table. And I stare at it a lot. I really do. I think about it a lot. It, it reminds me of memories. It reminds me of, of uh, hopes and dreams and uh, all kinds of things. When Vera Ray, my youngest daughter, is four years old now, but when she was a little bit younger, maybe two, two and a half, three years old, she began to notice that she wasn't in the picture. And so she asks us a while back now, oh, where, where am I at? Where's Vera Ray? And uh, so we actually coincidentally said, you know what? Actually, Vera, you are in mommy's belly. Because the story, the backstory of the, of the picture is that Andrew and I had gotten pregnant with Vera Ray. And uh, we wanted a picture with just me and Soraya and, and my wife and, Vera and uh, Jade before Vera was born. But Andrew was already pregnant. And so we began to explain to Vera, you're, you're in the picture too, like you're in mommy's belly. And so she always reminds us. And you know, I say, you know, where's Vera Ray in the picture? And she points and shows us where she's at. But that, that picture and that moment of Vera Ray, just, it has me thinking a lot. Thinking about what it means to grow and evolve. What personhood and identity and soul look like, right? I mean, think about it. You ever see a picture of someone and you go, man, you haven't changed at all. Or, or maybe you've seen another picture of somebody and you go, wow, you look so different, you know? Images have a way of doing that. They have a way of giving us that picture of like, wow, you've really changed or, or wow, you look just the same. But, you know, the reality is we, we're all changing. We're all shaping and shifting. Uh, I've got gray in my hair and wrinkles on my eyes and uh, I've got lines in my face and my skin looks different on my arms. I'm, I'm changing. I'm shaping. In fact, I'm not even the same as I was yesterday. I'm a different person biologically. I just look different. I heard it once said that uh, every seven years, the cells shift in such a way in your body that you've regenerated totally new cells. You're just biologically and physiologically different. And yet there's a part of us, our soul, that in such a way is, is the same and yet very different. And I've been thinking about what that transformation process looks like and, and, and what it means here. And Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 
to present your, your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Notice the changing words here, the transformation words. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing what you might discern, what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. So Paul, in his brilliance, already realizes, he's already aware that there are outside influences, outside powers that shape us, that conform us, that even change us, right? We have figures like parents, teachers, sages and gurus, rabbis and pastors. We have political leaders that affect us. In our era, we have media figures. Uh, maybe they're uh, actors or musicians. We have all these outside influences on our lives. And they shape us. But Paul says, I appeal to you that the mercies of God, the, the, the real transformation, uh, deep transformation, despite those outside influences, can be a moment with the resurrected king. So the first thing I want you to notice here for, from Paul's perspective, because of his own experience, that, that when God transforms them, when God meets you in whatever the road is, whether it's a literal physical road or it's a path in your bedroom or wherever that moment is that you, empower, you encounter the, the almighty power of God, that you have such a, such a shifting moment that God shatters all of the other stuff. And, and Paul says, you know, I, I know that you have these outside influences, but the real influence you need to succumb to, the real influence you need to, to, to turn your attention towards the thing that needs to become the, the, the uh, cataclysmic moment in your life that shapes all the other experiences, all the other forms of information, needs to be that mercy of God. That resurrection moment where you recognize, man, I am limited, I am dead to myself, and I want to be alive in God. And so the first thing I want you to notice is this. I want you to notice that God is a self-revealing God. That he, he might use a donkey. Remember, there's that Old Testament passage. He, he might even use me to speak to you. He might meet you alone somewhere. It might be through a song. I, wherever it is that God meets you, know this. God is self-revealing. He loves you in such a way that his mercy and grace appeal to you. They come to you. They shape you. And so then what we notice here is that the first great actor, the first great act of love ever done is God pursuing us. And so here at Romans has been Paul building this whole concept of God coming for us and God loving us and God redeeming us. And now Paul says, yeah, the first great act is God's love for you. That's the first great thing. But we have a responsibility to respond to that love. And so here's what it looks like for Paul. To present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So it's about now, our response to God's love looks like what? It looks like presenting ourselves as living sacrifices. It looks like us involved in spiritual worship. And so Paul's going to use... This idea for, for this century and this, this era, they would have known really well what temple worship looked like. And there's a couple of ideas I want to pull out of this temple worship fact. There's, there's this one idea is that a family would bring their absolute best, cattle or bird or whatever it was, and they would bring it to the temple, and it would, of course, be sacrificed. So Paul's going to use the analogy and go, you know what? This is not about you bringing something else. This is about you bringing you, you. Like the, great, the great response to God's love is not bringing some money to the church or not bringing your best clothes or not bringing your religious jargon. The thing that you can bring to God in response to his love is not an animal, it is you. And the thing that God's going to do with that is not kill it like he used to, but we're going to be a living sacrifice. So think about this. We're not bringing something to God. We're bringing us to God. I, I love that. I, I like this holistic element to faith. I, I, I like this, this concept that, that it's not just um, my Christian part of my life that I bring in some sort of foul cabinet. I've got the Christian part of my life. I don't just give you a, my private sphere of my life, but my public life, my private life, 
my whole life, in fact, body, mind, and soul, I offer to God. I'm going to give myself. And, and notice this. I don't, I don't give a dead deal. I give a living sacrifice. I give, I give my whole self. I was looking up the word here for worship. It's latreo. And latreo's root word is actually not worship. It's work. And so the idea that would have been understood here is that just as a, a, as a worker works for his boss in, in worthy uh, workmanship to deserve wage, right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna work hard to give what you can so that you'll receive God's blessings or the worker's blessings and pay. In the same way, our response to the, 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 the payoff of love from an eternal God, the, the response of, uh, of, of, to the love of, of God through uh, one day receiving heaven is that we work. We often think of worship as like the slow songs. But what I notice here is worship isn't just the slow songs. It's, it's my whole life. It is my work. And so my work as a father with my kids, loving them. I say work, that's a bad connotation sometimes. But my efforts, my actions to love my kids and love them well, to play with them on the trampoline and to provide for them, that kind of work, that's my worship. And when I go to the office and I, I do my best to study and think and work through things, that's not just my, uh, my work, my labor. That's my worship. And, and when I'm forgiving and, and kind to some guy on the phone that's upset my wife and I put in loving boundaries and, and I defend my wife and I'm respectful to him, that kind of ethic, that's my work. That's, in fact, my worship. My ethical response, the how I live, how I go about, how I do things, these are all my worship. Not just the slow songs, my whole life. And so Paul gives us this imagery, right? The, the, the work of coming to the temple, coming to what once was coming to a certain space for worship. He goes, he blows that idea up. It's not just a space. It's everywhere. You know, it's an interesting fact, right? God is everywhere, and guess what? So should our worship. Our worship shouldn't be uh, confined and conformed to just the private sphere of our life, but our worship, our faith, our identity as Christ followers should be in the everywhere of life. Everywhere God is, and He's everywhere, that's where my worship is as my work. Now, you know, Paul, remember Paul, he says, all these, these conforming, confining things of culture and status and society. He blows that up and says, your worship is everywhere. And he, and he says, you know what? You once brought these living things that are going to die on behalf of your sin for repentance. He blows up that concept, that religious idea, that religious jargon. He blows it up and says, no longer is that the case because Christ died for you. Your best worship isn't isn't encapsulated in the temple, it's everywhere, and it isn't encapsulated on a dead thing. It's encapsulated on your living life. You know, I was thinking about that. People die for others in very noble ways for all kinds of reasons. This We talk about rationale and thinking, right? There's all kinds of reasons people die for other people. Some do it for patriotism, some do it for religious reasons, some do it for emotional reasons, some do it just out of reaction, and, and they're all, in my mind, it's all, all a blessing, right? To save someone's life, to lose your life for someone else. I mean, remember Jesus' words, no greater love than this, to lose your life for another. I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful. That's, that's, that's awe-inspiring. I, I don't want to get into a competitive notion here, but I think about this. In some ways, it's easier to die for somebody than it is to live for somebody. I mean, I could, I could make it a, a fleeting, maybe irrational, emotional decision and take a bullet for you, and that would be a noble, great thing. I don't want to put water on that or ca cast any kind of doubt on that. But for me to give you my life, that's a, that, they're, they're, just, they're just different. And, but in some way, they're both, in my mind, they're, they're, they're awesome. They're, they're inspiring. They're, they're, uh, they're just, there's just something special about them. I've done great things for Andrea, but the greatest thing I will ever do for Andrea is to keep doing for Andrea. Now, with every breath, I just keep committed to her. I keep loving her. I keep serving her. That is my best. 
And that's kind of the imagery here. As a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God as your spiritual worship. I don't know about you, I like to think that I'm willing to die for God. I'd like to think if the moment came about and for some reason I had to die for my faith, I hope that God's mercy and grace would give me such a strength in such a way that I could perform that act. And there's another act that I hope that I can do. There's another kind of mercy and grace that I hope God pours in me, another kind of empowerment that I hope that God does in me. And that's that I could be a living sacrifice that not only would I be holy and acceptable in just one grandeur of an act, but that I could live my life in a worship, in a worship, in such a way that I am empowered to love God and love His people every day. Not in one grandiose moment, but in a grandeur of a living life that would look back on my life and yours and go, you know what? They didn't just give one moment. They gave every day. They didn't just give one good holy week. They did the holy life. What a challenge. What a great and grand challenge. That we wouldn't just live a great moment or a great Sunday. That we wouldn't just have a great Easter. But we would have a great every day for the rest of our lives. That is what it means to be a living sacrifice. But we don't confine our salvation, our spirituality to a moment and to a place. But it's everywhere, all the time, because so is God's presence and so is his love. My prayer is that God would lovingly empower us to live that kind of worship. Where it's not just in the slow songs where we're quiet and our hands are raised. But in the the big moments of life, in the quiet moments of life, in the mundane moments of life that we would all live as living sacrifices. So I want you to know these three things. God is self-revealing. but The first actor of love, the first agent of love to you is God. And, and he demonstrated that love through a way that he died on the cross and he rose again. And for like many of us, he's encountered us. We've had radical moments with him and therefore we are now resurrected with him. We're not dead men walking around with blinds in our eyes, but we are, we are living men and women. And because of that living, because of that life in us, because of that love in us, We're living sacrifices. And we live that life not in the confines of some temple or some synagogue or in our culture, some church or some building. In fact, we can't even meet here. But we live out that sacrifice in our everyday, in our everywhere. And it's not even reserved for just private moments of public worship. But the, the reservation, the limits of our worship get, get ripped in part and get ripped into shreds because we live it everywhere and in all times. And so our Christian ethic is that we go to work and we're ethical, we have integrity, we have kindness, and we, have, we tell the truth. We treat people with integrity and with dignity. Not because uh, uh, they, they necessarily have treated us well, but because it is our worship. It's our worship to do these things. Because worship is not relegated to our slow songs. Worship is in how we live. Holy, acceptable, and pleasing gifts to our Father. I appeal to you, therefore, Riverside Church, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, your souls, and your minds as living sacrifices, holy, and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. In closing, I want to challenge you with this. Uh, Vera, my four-year-old, she's got uh, Play-Doh, and she's got this really cool sand that she plays with, I don't know about you, but I could just play with that kind of stuff all day. I have, you know, tactile kind of uh, anxiety release, just playing with Play-Doh. I hate the smell of it on my hands, but I love playing with it, right? And Play-Doh is cool because you can shape it and mold it and um, and, and into whatever you want it to be. And there are some really cool videos out there you can watch on YouTube of people creating amazing things with Play-Doh. And the the, the concept here is that we mold and shape Play-Doh. 
And, and Paul is keenly aware there's all kinds of things that shape and mold our lives. There's even a myth out there in our society that um, our personality is molded and shaped for good by, what, three, five years old? I think this is a sort of common knowledge. I think it's a myth, though. I, I had the kind of belief that um, an all-powerful supernatural God can mold you and shape you into whatever he wants to, if you allow him. And I had the kind of belief that, I don't know about you, I, I hope I'm not like the guy on the phone. I, I, I like that he was introspective and understood that he was rough around the edges. He has an, an introspective recognition that sometimes maybe he hurts people's feelings. I, that's a good thing, but he stops there. I don't want to stop there. I don't want you to stop there. Let's be the kind of Christian that continues to evolve. And not by our own willpower, our own mind, but by the resurrection power, by the mercy, by the grace of God. Would you let God sort of mold you like that Plato today? Would you let your life become a kind of worship in such a way that integrity, honesty, and ethic, your workmanship become a kind of worship? And that God does the molding around your effort, and God does a molding and a shaping and a transforming of your heart that we might all be better people. I'm praying for you this week. My challenge is that we all be transformed, not only by the renewing of our mind, but by the craftsmanship of a father holding us in his hand. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Please like and subscribe to our podcast and tell your friends and family about us too. If you are a first-time guest, please visit us online at riversideatlanta.church and on our social media platforms at ATL Riverside on both Instagram and Facebook. For our regular attenders, you may still send your tithe and offerings online via our website, riversideatlanta.church, where you can find our donate button on the homepage. Thank you so much for joining us today. Like and subscribe and have a blessed day.